Welcome to In Conversation. Hello, Lynn. Thank you for having me. Who do you think should be looking after the internet? Well, I mean, I think that there is a responsibility that everybody has. Obviously, it's the platforms that have been making the rules to date, and they've been making rules to benefit themselves without any real guardrails to protect the public interest. So there you've got one, the platforms have a role. Two, the government has a role to make sure that the public interest uh, is being uh, taken in, into consideration and that things like privacy and competition are being protected. And thirdly, the users have a role to make sure that they are behaving responsibly. But the problem we have right now is that the internet is the largest unsupervised space on the planet. Mark Zuckerberg uh, came up with the mantra of the digital era when, when the, the, the Facebook motto was move fast and break things, right? Uh, I mean, what were they breaking? They weren't breaking physical objects. They were breaking the standards that had provided stability for the last century. And why move fast? Because you gotta move fast before anybody realizes that this is what's being imposed on you as a consumer. But what about examples like the mosque killings in New Zealand? Many people were appalled that Facebook didn't take the videos down more quickly. What do you think they should have done? This is the debate, if you will. Um, uh, there are some who argue that um, you don't want the platforms to have editorial control, and there are others that say you do want them to have editorial control. Um, I think I um, uh, tend towards the latter. Um, and, um, and my approach to all of this, Lynn, is, you know, it was computer science that got us in into this situation, and it should be computer science that gets us out, that harnessing artificial intelligence and capabilities such as that should be able to make content decisions, but you have to have the leadership that says this kind of thing will not happen. So you're saying that Mr. Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and all of them ought to get together and uh, say, we believe in truth, and that's what we're going to make sure is on our platforms. Seems a bit naive. But they have failed. They have. They, it is terribly naive. They have failed spectacularly. They have had opportunity after opportunity to do that. And they haven't. So what? And they haven't. Correct. So so which is why I think you asked the question at the outset, who could do something about this? And I said government has a role. And um, and so one of the things that. Um, that several of us have proposed here is we need a digital platform commission that has the expertise 
to pull together these kinds of individuals and say, okay, you got six months to come up with a behavioral standard that we will get to approve and that we will enforce. But this kind of Wild West, anything goes, doesn't go anymore. It's going to be very, very hard to enforce, though, isn't it? The European Union, um, with their Digital Services Act, um, has begun to chart a course as to how they think this can be done through law by requiring transparency of the decision making of algorithms and then notice and takedown, where I give you notice that this is something that is illegal or, uh, in, in their case, harmful, and you must take it down. What's really perplexing in all of this is that the algorithms make their decisions in secret. You don't know yeah. until the lie is put out there that it even exists. And, and, and then um, it takes forever to, to catch up and understand and do something about that. And, and so if you have notice and takedown, if you have an understanding of the decisions the algorithm is making, then you've got tools that you can deal with. So do you think that the Europeans are getting it right, that they are moving towards regulation that all the rest of us in the world, including here in Asia, should be looking at? They are certainly ahead of the rest of us. Um, and it has been incredibly thoughtful the way they have gone um, about it. So we're at the beginning of a process here that is going to produce some answers and some more information that we can use to guide ourselves going forward. But God bless them, they have at least started. In our country, we're not doing anything. And why is that? Was that the, when it took a, a, a turn with President Trump taking his hands off the internet completely and uh, therefore the regulators also taking their hands off the internet? Is it a political decision? You know, Lynn, I think that there was a, um, going back into the 90s, there was a belief in government that uh, we need to have hands off the internet. When I, was, when I was chairman of the FCC, I was constantly being told by members of Congress, you're trying to regulate the internet, as though there was something magic happening there and that if government got involved, it would break the magic and all the wondrous things would disappear. I think we have finally reached the point where we understand it's not magic <laughs> and that we need to be thinking about what are we going to do as a society to put the rights of the people back in the equation instead of basing everything around the rights of the uh, of the internet barons tech indirectly helping to fund terrorism by sharing ad money with terrorist organizations? Well, what you're going to see in, uh, in a couple of weeks are arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court that address that question specifically um, uh, on the 21st of this month, um, the, uh, the Gonzalez case, which says that YouTube, in running ISIS videos, was participatory in the 2015 Paris attacks that killed many people, including Ms. Gonzalez. And, um, and, but the other interesting thing in all of that is that, is that YouTube um, ran advertisements adjacent to those videos and shared the money with ISIS. And, um, and, and what are the rights there? And, 
And, and so what we've got in the United States right now is we've got two conflicting laws. We've got the Anti-Terrorism Act that says you can't do things like that. And we've got Section 230 of the Communications Act, which says that the platforms are, cannot be held liable for what they put on. And that's what the Supreme Court exists for. And so I think we're going to have an entirely different discussion about this after the Supreme Court um, wades its way or threads its way through this thicket. But the internet is essentially international. So even if, let's say, a video was banned here in Singapore because it was considered violent, it may be available in another country. So what's the point? Um, what I would like to see happen is I would like to see um, to have sufficient competition in the marketplace so that Lynn and Tom could figure out what sites they want to go to and what sites they want their kids to go to um, and, um, and make those decisions individually. But the problem we have today is that the major platforms are dominant platforms. You're not on Facebook, you're not alive, <laughs> right? And so we need to have some choices that, you know, my grandkids were, I spent the weekend with my grandkids uh, this past weekend. They got rules as to where they're allowed to go on the internet. I'd like them to have choices. They don't have choices. Um, and, and I think that's the kind of thing we need to do. And I also believe that, that those choices will be reflective of the um, local uh, mores um, and statutes. Uh, it's different in Singapore than it is in the EU. It's different in the EU than it is in the US. What we all need to be working together on is to say, okay, I, we're not going to dictate to Singapore. We're not going to dictate to Liechtenstein uh, what they're going to do. But we need to have compatible concepts that can be enforced locally based on local mores. So you're talking about what? A Google platform for Singapore or a, not a Google platform, just another platform uh, so that we wouldn't have to go to Google. But that wouldn't work, would it? Well, I'm in favor of multiple platforms uh, that one platform will be able to say, hey, we have really tough curation of content. We're not going to show ABCD. And, and that's where my grandkids yeah. are only allowed to go. But we have a situation right now where the dominant companies say it's my way or the highway. What about if I use the, you know, uh, I'll play the devil's advocate, I'll put on a big tech hat and say, but we at Google are actually doing that already. You can put in all these uh, barriers so that your grandkids can't see porn, so your grandkids don't see people being shot uh, in, in public at a mall. Uh, all of these things we can put in. You just have to click the right buttons and you, we can arrange that. So it's not our fault. It's because you as the consumers can't be bothered to put in the guardrails. So when's the last time you tried to do that? How many screens did you have to go through? What kind of rabbit hole did you have to go down to find the place where, no, I don't want this, but I do want that? Um, the difficulty is that the economic incentive of the platforms is controversy because controversy attracts viewers and viewers attract advertisers. We need to get to the heart of that question first. We need more responsible advertisers as well, don't we? Well, isn't it fascinating the way the advertisers responded to the changes in Twitter? That's true. So it does make a difference. If public opinion is against it, they will also withdraw their support, is what you're saying. I think that's what we've seen.
we can't talk about 5G without talking about China and Huawei. The problem with 5G seems to be a conflation of worries about whether to be afraid of China uh, or any other mm, government-motivated terrorism, or whether you're afraid of criminals the way they always have been, scammers who are trying to steal money from your bank account. Gee, I think you, uh, I think you misinterpreted what, what I wrote. What, what we were trying to say was that 5G is absolutely wonderful and the things that it makes possible are absolutely wonderful. But the technology it uses to get there is inherently an insecure technology because it is virtualized, meaning everything gets done in software. We know that software is inherently hackable and we know then that that creates a, a supply chain problem, if you will, where who wrote this piece of software becomes a very important security question. And so what we were trying to say was, hey, we need to have standards for cyber expectations for the networks. And those will deal with the vast panoply of choices, whether there are criminal activities, state actor activities, whatever the case uh, may be. But we've got to understand, we've got to start with understanding that the 5G network is inherently an insecure network. And what are we going to do about that? The focus that, that the Trump administration, for instance, put on Huawei distracted us from the real issue, which is the design of the technology itself. Well, simplistically though, People seem to think that, all right, if we just don't use, for example, in the US, Huawei, then everything will be safe. But that's not true, is it? It's a bigger question than that. This is not, this is not a question of uh, who, uh, ha who has their logo on the product, if you will. Um, there, one, of the, one of the subheads in the piece that we wrote is, do you know where your software has been? That the way software is built these days is using multiple other pieces of software that are outsourced that you have no idea what the security of those is. But maybe we have to accept that 5G is going to be messy and in order to have the benefits, it's going to be insecure. No, we don't have to accept it. There are ways that we can deal with it ahead of time by saying, here are the standards that we're gonna impose on the software that goes into our 5G networks to make sure that we've got, let's have zero trust, that we're going to check everything to make sure it doesn't have backdoors in it. Let's have ongoing activity, on, ongoing inspection to make sure that there aren't any surprises that got snuck in. And let's be aggressive about that and have understood standards as to how to deal with that and implement those kind of ideas, rather than saying, throwing our hands up and saying, oh my goodness, it's gonna be better. There's, you know, there's great parallels between this and what we were talking about in the first part of this interview. Keep your hands off the internet, don't touch it. Keep your hands off 5G, don't touch it. Well, how did the first one work out for us? The second one is a similar kind of challenge. But won't this have a, a really difficult uh, impact on small companies writing, for example, code who say, hey, I, I don't have you know, 20,000 employees, myself and my two other persons. We just don't have time to keep proving to you that everything we're doing is absolutely perfect and clean. And yes, we did do a bit of borrowing, but that's how it is. Small companies will be doing this. So what, are you going to buy a car? that has unsafe parts, what's, you know, what's, we, we expect that the people who make the wheel rims just to pick something on an automobile are in fact making safe wheel rims regardless of their size. Hmm, I take your point. So in other words, you're saying that even small companies should be able to live up to basic standards. Correct and that it won't suppress Everybody innovation. Is. Yes. Are we going to have a safe, secure, and yet an internet which is dynamic and has freedom of speech? Is that possible? Uh, yes, it is possible. What we need to have is to have a 
cooperative, collaborative process that establishes expectations about the online safety of the internet, about the cybersecurity of the internet. And we have failed to do that, at least in this country, up until this point. And, um, and, and we're, we need to start having that debate. We need to be discussing that policy. We need to be implementing that policy. And we need to understand that one of the things you can count on with technology is how rapidly it will evolve. One of my favorite experiences was I was participating in a seminar with the, 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 the late Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, and we were talking about the impact of technology on, um, uh, on, on diplomacy. And she said, you know, we take 21st century challenges, divide, d define them in 20th century terms, and propose 19th century solutions. And I said, Madam Secretary, I'm going to steal that. Because that's the trouble that we have with how do we deal with 21st century digital technology. We define it in terms of what we knew yesterday. And we propose solutions that are over 100 years old. And we need to have a dynamic, agile, creative approach to these new dynamic, agile, creative challenges. Tom Wheeler, thank you very much for being on In Conversation. Lynn, thank you. <laughs>